Well, good afternoon, and uh, I want to thank everyone who's joined us here today. We have our uh, Lieutenant Governor, Jeanette Nunez. Uh, we have Dr. Yuli Cho, who's the Director at the Department of Health in Pinellas County. I have Mike Jarosh. I have Debbie and Alexandra Levine, who are going to talk about uh, using monoclonal antibodies uh, and how that's, uh, how that's affected, uh, in Mike's case, him, and then Debbie and Alexandra's case, a uh, member of their family. We also have Senator Burgess, Mike Beltran, uh, Jackie Toledo, and um, I don't think we have the other ones. And so we appreciate you guys coming. Uh, Florida has now done over 30,000 monoclonal antibody treatments using our 21 sites that we've been able to stand up over the last uh, many, many weeks. And of course, those treatments um, are in addition to the nearly 13 million Floridians uh, who have received uh, the vaccine, including the overwhelming majority of people uh, over 50 and over 90 percent of seniors have received uh, at least one shot. Uh, since we've been in Hillsboro and the tanks, so we have Pasco, Hillsboro, Pinellas, uh, we have one in, uh, in Manatee. Um, if you look at all those sites, I mean, together they're doing thousands every single day uh, in the Tampa Bay area. Uh, and we're typically doing, um, you know, a total of, uh, or they're doing thousands, excuse me, thousands a week. We're typically doing um, about 4,000 treatments a day statewide, a portion amongst the 21 sites. The Hillsboro is typically doing about 200 a day. We have, we have the ability to do up to 320. Uh, some of our sites have gotten that, like in Broward and in, in Brevard. Um, most of them are usually uh, between 150 and 250 in terms of who's settling in. But what we're seeing is, fortunately, you know, we're seeing admissions to hospitals for COVID uh, decline from where they were. We're seeing the COVID uh, hospital census uh, decline, and we're seeing ED visits for COVID-like illness decline. So. That is really what we're looking to do by providing uh, greater knowledge and access to this type of treatment. If you get this early using a monoclonal antibody, uh, you have a great chance uh, to stay out of the hospital. And that's really what we're, what we're looking to do. And obviously, if you don't get admitted to the hospital, you're gonna recover. Uh, so it is uh, helping to save lives. What we saw earlier in the summer, you saw these hospital admissions going up and a lot of these folks, well, on the one hand, you'd say probably 80 to 90 percent of the people admitted had not been previously vaccinated. Uh, and then over 90 percent of, of everybody, vaccinated or unvaccinated, did not get a monoclonal antibody uh, after being infected. And so we saw that there was a lack of knowledge that a lot of the people that were getting infected didn't even know that this was something that was an option for them. So we highlighted some of the things that were done places like Tampa General, and this is something, the Regeneron and the Eli Lilly, but the Regeneron is what's being used against Delta, that was approved for emergency use in December of 2020. So it's been used uh, for a while, it's been used in Florida the whole time, but it was something that required a referral from a physician, and it wasn't something that was really discussed as much um, as it probably should be. We also noticed as the, as the summer was going on that the vaccines were providing good protection against severe illness, but there were a lot of people who were still getting positive tests. They call them breakthrough cases, but they really weren't as rare as we had hoped. And so there were people who were testing positive, who were fully vaccinated. And that's important because the people that are at most risk to COVID, elderly people that have comorbidities, most of those folks have been fully vaccinated for a while now. And so and you'll hear a story from the Levines about about their dad who is fully vaccinated and became and got symptomatic COVID this summer. Uh, so we saw that and we said, okay, look, um, if you're at risk, uh, the best thing you can do beforehand, obviously, is, is be vaccinated. But even if you are, um, and then if you're not, uh, if you do become COVID positive, you have an, a, a, an opportunity to get early treatment using these monoclonal antibodies. So the Regeneron is what has been used in Florida, partially because the Lilly hasn't, hasn't performed as well with the Delta variant. Now the GlaxoSmithKline is actually really, really strong data. It only got EUA relatively recently. Uh, the difference though is the GlaxoSmith is only in IV. The Regeneron can be IV or through subcutaneous. So you can come in and do four shots and that actually is, you can do more volume when you do that. 
Uh, and then Regeneron also you can use as a prophylaxis if you have an outbreak in like a nursing home. You can actually give it to people who have not necessarily tested positive but may be high risk and, and may be exposed. Also, the Regeneron was purchased by the federal government. So when that's coming down to states and it's going to our clinic, uh, that's coming at no cost to the state of Florida. And importantly, no cost to the patient. And so there's some folks that act like this is costing you thousands of dollars. That's misinformation. And I would hate for that misinformation to deter somebody from getting treatment that could actually help them and have to get them back on the mend and keep them, keep them out of the hospital. And so now the GlaxoSmithKline, as that becomes more available in kind of the normal medical marketplace, uh, I think you'll see that being utilized for Florida. Uh, I think most patients can get it. If you look at the different rebates that are offered, we're trying to figure out what, what that would look like. Uh, but sh clearly for now, you know, we have an effective option and patients can come in and they're not gonna be charged uh, to be able to do it. So we have 21 sites. Uh, obviously we have a good footprint in the Tampa Bay area, strong footprint really throughout the state. We tried to say, let's try to get it to where you look at our major population centers you know, can people have a, a reasonable way to be able to access one of these? And, and I think we've been able to do it. But it's important to point out, this is not the only way to get it. This has been offered uh, in hospitals and health systems uh, since December of 2020. Actually, Tampa General, they were doing some of the experiment, experimental uh, trials of Regeneron even prior to the EUA. So, so this is something that's available. So you may want to look uh, and see what's in your neighborhood if one of these sites isn't as convenient as you like. If you want to look at our treatment locations, you can go to floridahealthcovid19.gov. Uh, and then if you want to register, you can actually do an appointment beforehand. You go to patientportalfl.com. If it had been prior to us doing these sites, you would need to be referred from a physician in order to be able to go to, say, one of these infusion centers. Uh, we have done with the Surgeon General a standing order, and so you don't necessarily have to be referred from a physician. We're not saying don't talk to your physician. Obviously, I think that's, that's a smart thing to do, but you don't have to necessarily get a piece of paper signed. So if you come in uh, and if you fit the EUA criteria, uh, you're gonna be able uh, to be treated. And really, these treatments are most beneficial for people that are at high risk of severe illness from COVID. So of course, people who are older, people that have diabetes, people who are overweight, have kidney problems, immune, immunosuppressed, cardiovascular uh, or lung, lung conditions. And so if you get COVID positive and you go in early, uh, this has a great chance of resolving your symptoms short of needing to be, to be hospitalized. And so we've been doing this. People have had good re results. Uh, they've been talking, more people ask about it, and then it kind of builds where more people will then, will then seek it, uh, which, is, which is great. So we have some folks here um, who are gonna talk about it. And I think, uh, I think that these are really, um, really positive stories. And so one of the stories is actually uh, from uh, our Lieutenant Governor's family. So she's gonna come up here and talk about, uh, talk about her brother. Well, good afternoon. Thank you, Governor. And thank you to all of you that are here today. Uh, we are really proud of our administration's work, both on our vaccine deployment across the state, making sure that we prioritize seniors first. That was something that the governor took a bold approach in doing. Uh, and you've heard the numbers of our seniors being vaccinated. Uh, but as we know now, that vaccination doesn't necessarily prevent all COVID infections. So uh, the governor has also gone around uh, throughout the entirety of the state highlighting the importance of these monoclonal antibodies. Um, what we're seeing is that these monoclonal antibodies are preventing severe illness, they're reducing hospitalization, and quite frankly, they're saving lives. And as the governor mentioned just recently, my 82-year-old aunt and my 85-year-old mother, both fully vaccinated, tested positive for COVID-19. Um, my aunt has significant health issues, and so the doctor told me, do not wait, make sure she gets this treatment right away. Uh, and then shortly after, my mother tested positive, and so uh, both of them, I saw how quickly they recovered and how we were able to save off significant symptoms, hospitalizations, and again, for many individuals, this is a life-saving treatment. So we are proud of the work that our administration has been doing to make sure that Floridians throughout our state have access to this incredible treatment. Uh, we're proud that we have now 21 sites. Um, if I knew the governor, I would tell you we're not stopping there. Uh, we're gonna make sure that everyone has access to this, and I think it's an important event today 
uh, to make sure that we highlight the importance of education and awareness. And I think our legislators that are here are doing a great job touting it in their districts and their communities. But we understand that we have certain tools at our disposal. Number one, obviously the vaccinations. Uh, number two, monoclonal antibodies. So we really urge Floridians to take note of the sites that are located close to them to make sure that they utilize this because in the end, um, I've seen it firsthand. I think you're gonna hear some really powerful stories of others that have seen it firsthand. Um, this is indeed a game changer. So thank you, Governor. Okay, Doctor. Good afternoon. Uh, I want to thank the governor, the lieutenant governor, and the state leadership for their continued support in pushing out uh, vaccines as well as monoclonal therapy. Now, starting with vaccines, vaccine uh, are the, is the key. And while we have seen some breakthrough cases, uh, it still remains effective uh, in preventing severe illness, hospitalization, and death. Vaccines now are readily available uh, in the pharmacies, medical clinics, and the health department clinics. Locally, we will continue to work with our uh, partners, uh, churches, businesses to really push it out there. I strongly encourage you uh, to protect yourself, uh, family, and the community through uh, getting vaccinated today. But with the monoclonal uh, antibody therapy, it is an, certainly an important tool in the toolbox. Uh, as the governor mentioned, it has decreased, shown to decrease hospitalization risk by 70 to 75%. In addition, it has shown to decrease the severity of illness as well as the duration. Uh, it's given uh, to those uh, diagnosed with COVID-19, uh, those uh, that are exposed and that are high risk for develop, uh, developing complications. And more importantly, our local hospitals have been asking for it. Um, it, it would uh, decrease some of the ER volume as well as uh, the hospitalizations on the back end. So again, I wanna thank the governor for making uh, that access available. Uh, in Pinellas, uh, we did open our site sometime mid last week at the Holy Trinity Orthodox Greek Church, and we have uh, administered treatment to about 873 individuals thus far. So again, it is a great treatment option, and just keep that in mind. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're we gonna do. Who do we got coming up? Now? We got Mike Jarosz. <clears throat> Thank you, Governor. I appreciate the opportunity to share my experience on this. Um, several weeks ago, uh, I came down with symptoms that I had heard about that resembled COVID bad headache, congestion, mild fever, and body aches. So I woke up on a Monday morning and immediately went to a facility that offered um, both a test to show that I was positive as well as the Regeneron treatment. Um, when I tested positive, they administered the treatment. I did the IV infusion. It took about an hour and a half. Uh, I had to be wait, wait for about a half hour to 45 minutes for them to observe me to make sure nothing else happened. And following that, I went home. I took it easy for the rest of the evening. Um, went to bed relatively early because I was feeling pretty lousy. Uh, when I woke up Tuesday morning, amazingly, all the primary symptoms were completely gone. No headache, no fever, no body aches, anything. So for me, it was quite amazing and a miraculous thing for me because I didn't know what to expect from the COVID and the, the sickness it, it uh, promoted. Um, and it was nice because that day I actually was able to still get some work done. And I'm sure my employer appreciated that. <laughs> so um, thank you again, Governor. I appreciate you educating and getting this information out. Without it, I don't know what my results would have been, but I'm very thankful for that. Great. All right, the Levine. Thank you, Governor, for having us. My name is Deborah Levine, and I want to relay a story about my father. Louis S. Barron, who, was a world, who is a World War II veteran. He was stationed in the Philippines as a precision calibrator who worked on guns and bombs. He also worked on the Doolittle airplanes and was stationed at Eglin Air Force Base. And while he was there, he helped train the Tuscany uh, men. Originally, my father was from the Washington, D.C. area, where he was a grocer and later became a restaurant owner, which he served senators, congressmen, presidents, celebrities, and people from all over the world at Barron's Gourmet Deli. Unfortunately, on June 23rd, 2021, Dad slipped and fell. He fractured his hip and had a partial hip replacement. Dad went to a skilled nursing facility for rehab. 
Dad was doing well in therapy and was scheduled to leave Friday, August 13th. But on the Monday prior to him leaving, I got a call from the rehab facility telling me that Dad had contact, uh, contracted COVID-19. I was beside myself because I had just seen my dad the day before and he seemed fine. But I was told that he had a dry cough and he was not feeling well. And I could not believe that he got COVID-19. Because for over a year and four months, I had taken care of him to make sure that he was fine during that lockdown period. Immediately, visitation was canceled. My aides had to leave in self-quarantine. I was so concerned because I could not see my dad and I did not really know how he was doing. He was given cough medicine, then mucinex was added. I asked for a chest x-ray and it showed that dad had fluid in his lower right lung. I reached out to his doctor at the facility to see what could be done as I was having sleepless nights worried over the situation. The doctor told me about a new treatment that had been out for about six years, uh, six weeks, excuse me, uh, called the Regeneron Infusion. It's an infusion of antibodies. I had also seen Governor DeSantis' news conference, and so I wanted this treatment for Dad, but I was told there was a protocol that had to be used to get this. I was told by the doctor that the treatment was given at Sarasota Memorial Hospital as an outpatient. I asked, how was dad gonna get there? The doctor said I could put dad in my car and drive him over there. I asked him if there was transport. He said, yes, but it'll be very expensive, about $400. The doctor said he did not arrange this for me, but I was to arrange it with the nurse from rehab. I spoke with her and told her to order the transport. Also, Dad had a second COVID test and it came back positive. A positive read is one of the criteria for getting the treatment. I had waited till that Friday after Dad had contracted COVID to get my own COVID test. I had been vaccinated like my father, but my family members wanted me to get the test just to be sure I did not have COVID, which I didn't. So I went to Sarasota Memorial Hospital outpatient on Bee Ridge Road. I was getting my test. I talked about my father to the doctor who was examining me. She gave me a paper that had an emergency phone number in which the physician caring for my father could call to set up an appointment for my dad to have the treatment. She said it was the Regeneral treatment and we give it right here in this building. I went home Friday night at 5.30 in the morning on Saturday, I called my dad's doctor from rehab. I knew he would not be there at this hour on Saturday, but I wanted him to have the emergency number so we could call and make the appointment for dad as soon as possible. I did not hear from him. But at 9.45 in the morning, the head of nurses called me from the rehab to say they were waiting for the infectious disease department to get back to them so my dad could have the treatment. He said that was the protocol, and maybe today would be the day Dad could get the treatment. Saturday came and Saturday went. Sunday was also flying by. Every time I called the rehab, the nurse would inform me that the infectious diseases had not been has, had not responded yet. I knew you had to get the treatment within a week for it to be useful. I was beside myself. My daughter, Alexandra, was visiting from Washington, D.C., and I said, maybe we should contact the governor's, the governor's office. My daughter decided to write a letter to Governor DeSantis. On Monday night, I received a phone call from Dr. Kenneth Shepke, the emergency medical physician. He asked what was going on with my dad. He had received Alexandra's letter. He said, you will not have to transport your father in your car. We will come to him. I could not believe what I was hearing. Dr. Kenneth said he would bring in a strike team facilitated by the governor's office to give my father the infusion at the rehab facility. A miracle. All our prayers had been answered. My sister, Jill, who works for the VA in Fort Lauderdale, was so excited, we were crying. We felt our governor was listening to the people and doing all to help. 
Dr. Kenneth was kind enough to send me the forms and walk me through filling them out. Within 24 hours, my father was given the infusion without having to get out of the sick bed and be transferred elsewhere. My family thanks Governor Ron DeSantis, Dr. Kenneth Schwepke, and the wonderful strike team led by William Butler for helping my father. We thank everyone who helped in this amazing treatment process because not only did my father receive the treatment, but all the residents of the rehab facility who needed it received it. We thank you so much for my dad, Louis Barron, and our entire family. Thank you to our wonderful governor, Ron DeSantis. And I just wanted to reiterate, uh, my name is Alexandra Levine. I'm the granddaughter of Louis S. Barron. And I kind of just wanted to reiterate the contact um, that I made with Governor Ron DeSantis. So on sat Sunday morning, um, August 15th, when we didn't hear back from infectious diseases with the Department of Nursing, I personally called and emailed Governor Ron DeSantis' team. And as my mother emphasized, they were right on it. Dr. Kenneth Shepke, and I thank him, I wasn't here today, but I thank him from the bottom of our hearts as well. He called my mother that Monday night at 8.30 at night, and he said, and we told him what was going on, that we had to wait for infectious diseases to approve my grandfather to get this shot, and it had been a week and a day that my grandfather had COVID-19, and his COVID was not getting treated at his rehabilitation center. And Dr. Shepke said, no problem, we will take care of we will take care of it for you. We will get somebody in there at less than 24 hours, which he did on Tuesday, August 17th at noon. My grandfather was administered with the strike team 2.5 milliliters of sub Q infusion. Not only was my grandfather saved that day, but five other people were saved that day by the governor's strike team and by Dr. Kenneth Shepke. And my grandfather was the first patient of his rehabilitation center to receive the Regeneron infusion, in addition to the five other patients that were saved that day. And since my grandfather has gotten the Regeneron shot, he is recovering very well, and he is in his brand new facility, and he is extremely happy. And my message today is if you are a facility or a hospital that has these Regeneron shots, do not hesitate. Please administer them the second your patient tests positive for COVID. The shots do save lives. Studies have shown that the minute you administer the shot, the patient sees results and bounces back within 48 hours. I just came back from the Lone Star State of Texas, and I can tell you that when Governor Abbott tested positive for COVID and he got his Regeneron shot, he bounced back within days. Also, I just want to say thank you to Governor Ron DeSantis, or Lieutenant Governor Jeanette Nunez, your wonderful wife, Casey, the, the staff, William Butler, Dr. Kenneth Shepke, for working so hard to save my grandfather's life and to save other lives. And because of you, Governor, my grandfather can live another day and hopefully many more years to come. As a World War II veteran, my family and I were not going to sit back and watch my grandfather died in a hospital when he worked so hard for our nation. And on a personal note, I just want to make a shout out to all my friends and family from all over the country and the world who said prayers for my grandfather. I felt your prayers every day. Prayers are powerful. And let me tell you something, they do work. So thank you. Thank you, Governor. Thank you, everybody. And my father just wanted to say something very quick, Mr. Richard Levine. It's my understanding that my father-in-law is one of the oldest Air Force veterans from World War II alive. Can I say to you this, whether you're 59 and a half, 69 and a half, or my father-in-law's age is 98 and a half years old, whoever needs this treatment to rid this COVID-19 from their body, the treatment should be administered, they should get this 48 hours, Hence, be healthy again and move on with their lives. That's the key. Life is for the living. That's what this Regeneron allows people to do, to live. Thank you again.
sharing those stories and uh, I think that you know, one of the frustrating things was just seeing people who had been admitted this summer and very few of them got this but very few of them even knew about it and so this is something that uh, needs to be part of what, what we do going forward. I mean the fact is if you look at kind of how you know COVID is uh, with, with the, how it, the different iterations and now with the, it's going to be something that's going to end up becoming an endemic respiratory virus and that means it doesn't just end. You know, we kind of hope that with, you know, vaccines that it would potentially create a herd immunity. But you see uh, places, um, you know, all in Florida that have high, Israel, all these other places, you know, you're still seeing um, infections. And so the question is, uh, what can you do to protect yourself knowing that this may be something you very well will come in contact with at some point uh, in the future? And, of course... Uh, the data is very strong that vaccinated individuals are much less likely to be admitted to the hospital. Uh, in the state of Florida, I would say probably 80 to 90 percent of most of these uh, uh, COVID censuses in most of these hospitals are with people who were not vaccinated. If you look at the mortality from the last two weeks of July, beginning first two weeks of August, uh, it was about 70 percent. Uh, of the mortality was unvaccinated, 10% partially vaccinated, 10% fully vaccinated, and 10% unclear. Uh, but if you put that into perspective, yeah, obviously there's more unvaccinated than vaccinated, but that doesn't even tell the whole story. The people that are most at risk for COVID are overwhelmingly vaccinated. So you got a huge group of people who are vaccinated. The mortality is much smaller than in a much smaller group who are unvaccinated. Over 50 unvaccinated is between 13 and 17 percent uh, of the state, depending on how you calculate it. And yet you're seeing more mortality just there than in all these other many, many more millions of people. So uh, the, the chances of surviving COVID is much higher, you know, with the vaccination. The same thing I think is true here or similar. You know, if you do become infected, regardless of your vaccination status, because as we've seen, we've got vulnerable people who are testing positive, uh, who are developing symptomatic illness. And of course, we hope most of these illnesses end up being mild for vaccinated, but we are seeing people admitted to the hospital. So regardless of that, what can you do? Do this early uh, makes a huge difference. And so, you know, we're happy that this is now, we're over 30,000 treatments in the state of Florida, uh, 21 sites, and, you know, we're gonna keep uh, doing this. And then as we go, you know, further down the road, this has just gotta be something that's built into our healthcare system to where any, any uh, at-risk person uh, who's test positive in the future should immediately be referred to this. This is not mandated on anyone. It's your choice. You've got to decide what you want to do. Uh, but this should be, we want 100% of the people to know that this is available. And, uh, and folks know that if they're in that situation, they have the ability to do it. So we appreciate the progress. You know, this is something where we, we started to see, you know, as you started to see more admissions, um, you know, as we got into, you know, the middle end of July, we were looking at, at okay, what's, what, you're talking to hospitals. And this was, a, this was one of the things that they felt had been effective when done. So we sprung into action, raised awareness, and now we've got a great infrastructure throughout the state of Florida. And it is helping people, and we want to continue to do that. We hope, Obviously, we hope no one gets infected. This is very contagious, and so you know, there are going to be cases. And so what can you do to prevent serious illness? And this is one tool among others, but this is one tool that's been underutilized throughout the country. Now we're utilizing it better in Florida and we're creating more knowledge about it. And look, at the end of the day, if uh, you know, we, we were with in Jacksonville earlier, you may have seen it. There was a photo of a, of a woman in our Jacksonville monoclonal site lying on the ground and it kind of went viral and she was in really, really bad shape. Uh, she had, her mother had seen that we had opened the site. She said, you should go there and get the monoclonal. So she got it. And within 48 hours, you know, she was, uh, her fever had subsided, oxygen had, been, had recovered. Uh, she was, and she said, look, I would have been in the ICU the next day had I not gotten uh, the Regeneron. And so now she's back and, and, and has recovered. And it's a great story. But, you know, had, had we not done that, she would not have even known to go in um, and get it. And so that's what we want to do. We just want to make sure that people are availing themselves of everything that's out there to try to help them. And so I want to thank everybody here in the Tampa Bay area who's been involved with these sites. You know, the Department of Health, most of these county health departments and the state, a lot of the people who are getting the treatment 
test positive, maybe they fit a profile for being at risk, they're actually, some of them are getting called by the health department saying, hey, you've tested positive, uh, here's something you can do. And so then they're going in and they're being referred to where they can go. And so we really appreciate uh, the, the proactive uh, way that this is being done all throughout Florida. And with that, I can take a couple questions. Governor, do you think there's been resistance from the medical establishment to this kind of treatment, and if so, why? That's a good question. The question is, is there been resistance from the medical establishment for this kind of treatment? I can tell you that the data on this is very good. Even, even Dr. Fauci acknowledged that this is something that's very effective. Um, I do think that for whatever reason, there has been a resistance to talk about treatments at all, and I'm not sure why that is. I think part of it was, I think when we look back on this, if you're in a position where you're kind of a medical authority, you got to tell people the truth and let them make decisions. And I think there's always kind of been a, 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 a part of this where they would tell the public what they thought would lead to the behavior that they wanted to see. Uh, and so I think that there was some concern that if you told people there's treatment that could be effective, that that may cause them then not to seek vaccination. Of course, that's not the message. This is not in lieu of, this is in addition to. Um, but I do think that there, for whatever reason, has been some resistance. Because I do think if you look, since the, the, this was approved, how underutilized it's been nationwide, and then you're seeing some of the effects, the positive effects, I absolutely think that if this has been promoted, better, uh, I think you would have saved, uh, kept a lot of people in the hospital, I think you'd have saved a lot of lives. And so let's just understand there's a, a lot of different tools here. No one is saying this is the only game in town. No one's saying that, um, that, that, this is, that this is something you should put all your eggs in that basket. But it is something that's been utilized. It's something that has been effective and hopefully more and more folks. One of the things that really concerned me is, is and when we really were like, man, we gotta do something, there were physicians who didn't know about it. You, know, you talk to Dr. Shepke, our, our emergency management uh, chief medical officer, he would talk to some of his friends who are in the back. They didn't necessarily even know uh, what Regeneron was. There are people in very high positions in, in our government that didn't know what Regeneron was or didn't know what the monoclonal was. And so that was something that was really, really problematic. And so at the end of the day, put out all the information, put out all the data on the vaccines, put out all the data on the monoclonals, um, and then let people, you know, make decisions. And that's what I've tried to do. I mean, on the vaccines, when we rolled them out, I would recite every single stop we did, the Pfizer data, I'd recite the Moderna data. When J&J &J came out, I would do the J&J. &J. I mean, I remember the media saying J&J &J wasn't as effective. And, and I looked at it, I said, wait a minute, it's very effective at preventing hospitalization and death, which is really the most important. And actually, J&J's held up pretty well um, against the Delta variant. Um, I was critical when they pulled back the J&J, because my view was you should just provide the information. If there were certain segments of the population that were more at risk, just provide that. Uh, but I think when they dialed that back, I think that really caused some vaccine hesitancy. Um, so provide the data. And then now the data we provide about the hospitalizations. Every time I go out, I'm always providing the, the most up-to-date data that we're getting about how the hospitalizations break down between vaccinated and unvaccinated. And they skew very heavily to vaccinate, unvaccinated. And that's not even telling the whole story because most of the high-risk people are vaccinated. And so you're really talking about a relatively small segment who is leading to a disproportionate. So those are the facts, that's the data. But I also am honest when some people have said, if you take the shot, you'll never get COVID. That's obviously not true. And we've gotta be honest with people. And we've gotta say people are testing positive. I think hopefully it probably reduces your chance of being infected, but it's certainly not the 95% that we got in the clinical trials, which is fine. Just be honest with people, let them know. And that's one of the reasons why if uh, you know, the CDC has said the vaccines aren't preventing transmission, so that's the case, uh, you very well may be vaccinated, may, may end up getting COVID, and here's something to think about. Governor, HB1 is uh, in the board today. Can you just quick comment on that, please? So HB1, of course, that was our bill that did two, two basic things. One is it told, uh, said to the people of Florida, if a local government tries to defund law enforcement, we at the state, we're gonna make sure to block that. We are not gonna let the police be defunded in the state of Florida. If you look where that's happened throughout this country, it's been disastrous with the, um, the crime that is just totally spiking out of control. So you gotta stand by law enforcement. We'll do it. The other component that was really significant 
is really serious penalties for folks who are engaged in violent assemblies or any type of mob violence. In Portland, you engage in mob violence, they slap you on the wrist, put you back on the street. Here in Florida, we're making sure that you're going to see the inside of a jail cell. I'm confident, look, when we're in, just, when we're in trial courts, it is what it is. I mean, last year, remember, uh, they sued us to close the schools. We, had, we, were, we were getting the schools open. They sued us. We lost in the trial court. We won in the appeals court. That was state court. Um, so I'm confident that, that we will eventually win however it shakes out. And um, I think that we're safer as a result of, of, of that bill. And I think we were safer as a result last summer when we called out the National Guard. We were working with all the local law enforcement as a team. They knew the governor stood by them 100%, and they were able to really, I think, um, you know, keep order in a way that some of these other cities were not. You can talk about all these important issues that we always talk about, education, uh, talk about jobs. Obviously, we've done well economically in Florida, and it's all important. You don't have that baseline of public safety. A lot of that, that just kind of goes out the window. We need to have safe communities, and that was one way to be able to do it. Yes, ma'am. Governor, you talked about how the data shows So here's the, the question about Delta and, and, and the kids. So the American Academy of Pediatrics recently acknowledged that they're seeing that there's no evidence that they've seen that Delta is more impactful on, on kids than the prior uh, variants. And if you look at the number of people, uh, the, the people under 18 who've been hospitalized for COVID in Florida, the whole pandemic, it's been between 1.1 and 1.3% of the total COVID positive patients. Also, CDC pointed out last week in their briefing that uh, because of the out-of-season RSV, a lot of the kids hospitalized or are hospitalized for RSV. They may be incidentally COVID positive, but really the RSV was driving um, a significant amount of that. That being said, you know, look, I'm a parent of three young kids, four, three, and 17 months. Someone pops a fever, I mean, as a parent, you know, you, you start to get, you, it just causes you to really react. And so, um, uh, and so I don't want to belittle the idea that someone could end up having some symptoms. But I do think the data is pretty clear that we have not seen any difference in terms of the proportion, um, in terms of hospitalizations or mortality, uh, which is a really, really good thing. Um, and I think that that's something that is, um, that is important just to point out. Again, not saying that, that um, you know, people can't catch, not saying people can't test positive, but in terms of this being materially different from the COVID that we've seen so far, uh, that has fortunately uh, not been the case. And this is something that is having similar, relatively mild effects on kids. And I think it's also important to point out in perspective, nationally uh, in the United States, uh, if you look at the number of of under 18 that have died with COVID. It's important to point out that counts people that are COVID positive that died for other reasons. And in most of these cases, there were really serious uh, underlying uh, issues that, uh, that really were the primary cause. But put that aside, compare that to the flu season of 2018, even a year and a half into COVID, that's still less than the flu season was. And then compare it to H1N1, H1N1 was about four times uh, what we've seen, and that's just in one year, what we've seen in a year and a half so far. And again, fortunately, we're not seeing anything uh, different um, in terms of, we obviously are seeing more transmissibility in Delta. There's no question about that. I mean, if you look at it, it's like you will have way more uh, infections when this thing starts to pop uh, than, than previous. And I think that's going to, I think that's been true. And I think it's going to continue to be true, you know, as other parts of the country, when they will, unfortunately, end up having to hit a Delta wave. But in terms of the severity, I, I just as a parent, you know, I, I remember when this first started, my wife's nagging me out of like, hey, how is this going to affect it? And I was, the data was always very good, but you know, as these new things come, I mean, parents understandably have questions, but uh, we've not seen any major changes in terms of that. And again, um, CDC had said that if you want, look at their briefing last week, and then if you look at the American Academy of Pediatrics, they, one of their leaders just said, you know, they've not seen evidence of that. And I think that that's just been, been borne out with, uh, with what we're seeing. Now, we have seen um, more school-age positive tests because we've seen a massive increase in tests being conducted. So while uh, positive tests 
for people over 20 um, have declined on the seven-day average over the last couple of weeks. Uh, the total statewide average has remained relatively consistent, and a lot of that's being driven uh, by those. But most of those are mild cases, uh, which are not presenting uh, symptomatic illness. Okay, everybody, th thank you. i got to run to the next stop, so we'll see you soon. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.